Genibus. Patrick, good morning. Um, over to you, and off we go. Morning, Jeff. Thanks very much. Uh, just making sure you can hear me loud and clear. Can do, yes. And I've done Perfect. a test with Excellent. some attendees, and we know that they can hear, so we're up and running. Excellent. Excellent. Well, look, uh, thanks very much for that, Jeff, and welcome, everyone. Uh, to September's Regenibus member meeting. Delighted to have all of our members here at number one. Plus also we've opened this up to uh, our community and the community. Um, given the importance of this topic in the cannabis industry around ESG, environmental social governance, um, how do we talk about it? How do we communicate it and so forth? So we're super excited to have uh, our esteemed guests here today, which we'll introduce very shortly. Um, I just want to welcome uh, several of our new members, including Ascend Wellness and Ascend Wellness Foundation, who are doing incredible work uh, and uh, a, a leading MSO here in the States. And we're super excited to have Ascend, given the work that they've been doing. Um, so just a few very quick updates uh, for our members. And I know this is, again, this is not a closed door um, meeting, so the, the, uh, the community can listen and hear. Um, they cannot, the, the, the external community cannot actually be visible, by the way, just so, so you're aware of that. They're not, you're not visible to the um, audience. So just some very quick updates for, for our members. Um, we've decided to move forward the Regenerative Cannabis Live event, which was uh, scheduled for October the 27th. Uh, due to a number of, ex of external uh, factors, we're going to be moving that forward to May the 4th. Um, so everything will remain the same. Um, and I think nearly every one of our partners will be continue to stay with the, um, uh, the event as it was originally planned. Uh, and every member, of course, has, as part of the membership benefits, has a number of different seats at the, at the event. So we'll be honoring all of the seats that we had committed to for the, this particular event, which is going to be moved to May the 4th. Um, so if there's any questions on that, feel free to reach out to us, info at Regenibus, uh, anytime, and we can, we are, our team are on standby to respond to any questions about the, the day change or any uh, opportunities to speak or partner uh, and to participate at the event. Um, the second uh, update that we have for our members is for next month. Um, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the resource efficiency and sustainability in the cannabis industry. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with, with the Hawthorne Gardening Group, and they have, uh, they've actually done a very, very exciting report around resource efficiency, and we're going to take a deep dive into that uh, next October. So that's going to be uh, most of the, the, the meeting will be focused on that for uh, the Regenerative Member meeting in October. Um, the third update we have is around uh, Regenibus, um, and most of you know at this stage, particularly our advisory board and several of our, our, our key partners, that we're, we're going to be embarking on a fundraising campaign with our own partners at WeFunder. Um, we've decided that, well, one, that we need the funds to build out uh, the SaaS platform that we're, we're looking to uh, build out, which is going to be called ESG Excel. We alluded to this at the event at the United Nations in May, uh, and we're, we're going to be moving forward with that. So this is not just an opportunity to invest in, in, in Regenibus, but also an opportunity for us to democratize the opportunity for many others across the globe to invest in a cannabis organization or an ancillary organization in the cannabis industry. Um, so we'll have more information about that. If anybody, again, has any questions around that, uh, feel free to reach out to us, info at regenibus.com. Um, so there are the number of different updates that we have for, for this month. Again, um, we're, we've got a super, super uh, lineup for today. And uh, I'm going to take a deep dive into the, the very hot topic around ESG. Um, I, I believe there's about 10 uh, ESG reports right now in the global cannabis industry out of about 230 publicly listed cannabis companies. Uh, and of the tens of thousands of cannabis companies, there's only about 10, maybe up to 12 uh, ESG reports. So we're still at the very, very dawn of this new uh, age of ESG in the cannabis industry. But we believe uh, and hope, of course, that this is going to really skyrocket 
uh, over the next year or two. And it, it's really going to uh, offer up the opportunity for companies to really to, to um, progress, to mature, to professionalize, and that will open up a whole new uh, doors to, to investment, to opportunities to speak with you know, corporations and other industries who are demanding that companies uh, have uh, positions around DSG and sustainability. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to pass back over to Jeff Trotter. Uh, I know most of you know Jeff Trotter, but just to give you a very little quick background on Jeff, Jeff's um, a co-founder at Regenibus. Uh, I worked with Jeff at Sustainable Brands for several years. We built out the many of the areas within uh, and the uh, verticals within uh, Sustainable Brands. And uh, Jeff has previously was with uh, a partner with the EY in Hong Kong. So um, I'm delighted to well, pass you back to Jeff, uh, who's going to introduce our, our guests, Jonathan Johannan uh, and the team at Ascend Wellness. Jeff. Uh, thanks, Patrick. That's awesome. Thanks. Great in, uh, introduction. Great update on a whole raft of things that we're busy working on at Regenibus. Um, but let's get ourselves into the present. Um, Patrick did reference um, sustainable brands. Uh, he and I worked there for a good period of time, um, some, you know, in the last decade. Um, and two of our advisory board members, uh, Demita Vlahov, uh, who's uh, attending today, as well as Jonathan Yohannan, were, were close colleagues of ours. Um, Jonathan, uh, can I ask Jonathan to switch on your video? Hi, Jonathan, and, and your microphone. Hey, great. Morning. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, we've got Jonathan here. He has an incredible background, uh, if I say so myself. Um, prior to coming into client side communications uh, at both Panera, Panera Bread, and then most recently at Kind Snacks where he was the senior vice president of internal external communications. Um, prior to that decade on the client side, he was on agency side uh, with one of the biggest advertising agencies out there, uh, Omnicom. And so more than two decades of communications skill and experience of internal, external on all manner of aspects um, uh, uh, related to communications. And over the last, I, I guess, 10 to 15 years, Jonathan, you've really sort of excelled in the space of sustainability very much in the early days. Um, and I know recently also, whilst you were at uh, Kind Snacks, did all manner of things related to um, crises management, et cetera. So you've got, a, um, from a content perspective, a, a, a great background around all the um, different areas of communications that corporations are blessed to ch and, and challenged with um, and we just felt it would be great if we could before we get into the conversation with Rebecca and with Danielle at Ascend we thought let's just take a, a, a sort of a step back away from the, the cannabis industry generally and and talk a little bit more about some of the things that we feel and I know that Jonathan can speak uh, very eloquently about almost like a sort of a communications 101, but I'll shut up at this point. Jonathan, why don't you just give us a little bit more of an introduction uh, about yourself and, and tell us a little bit more about what we're going to be talk, talking about this morning for, for the next 20 minutes. Yeah. Hey, listen, uh, this is just, uh, it's great to meet you. I wish I could see you live in person. And Jeff, thanks for the uh, great introduction. But um, look, I'm a resource for you. I think the thing is uh, the space, this particular space continues to emerge and evolve the marketplace even in the past year or two. So as much as you might think you're an expert, you have to be nimble and be able to be flexible and see and try to look around the corner. And I think that's a lot of the, the discussion that Jeff and I are gonna to get to. There's no slides. This is just a quick Q&A. And if there's any follow-up that any of you wanna have directly, I'm happy to do that as well. But I think, um, look, I think it, it all starts, and I'll, Jeff, if you wanna start with, it all starts with your purpose and why you exist. And I would say, as Jeff described, a lot of organizations uh, on this call are still at the infancy of, of sort of how do you communicate purpose? What does ESG mean? How do your stakeholders even know why it's relevant? What is sustainability and how is it related? How do I get started with no comms person in place? What does that all look like? 
And I think, you know, the key of this is that I think we can focus on the report day in, day out. It's just a tactic. The more important thing is those first parts of the question, which is why do you exist? What makes you distinct and different? And then what are your external risks and how do you communicate that in a cohesive way? Um, particularly for internal office audiences first, a lot of times we really worry about, oh my God, what's the risk that's going to come my way and how does that look like? If you don't get your internal leadership and your internal teams, call them team members, partners, or whatever engaged, it's not going to matter. They're not going to believe it. So I think that's probably the first place I would start. A lot of people are jumping now to be like, oh my God, who's going to write the report? The report is just a, a, a tactic. It's a manifestation of that. And the reason why people struggle with reports is because they don't have a strategy and they don't have alignment. So that's why reports take so long. Otherwise, reports would be much easier to, to produce. So, um, but uh, Jeff, go ahead. I don't know if you... Yeah, no, that's, that's great. It's, I, I oftentimes, you know, folks focus on um, some of the end products and think that, that that's it. I mean, of course, if we're talking about reports, whether it's a sustainability report, an ESG report, whether it's a product launch report, whatever the report is, um, certainly if it's sustainability and or ESG, then it's a journey. It's an iterative journey. And so it's one thing to get the report out. It's another to think always on the continuity of the aspects that you're reporting out. Um, how, how do you see that um, from, a, a, from a strategic and then a tactical perspective? What, what's, what, where does that all land and where's the focus? Where does that focus need to be? Well, I think, I think organizations are gonna struggle with even the terms to be candid. We're all very well-versed in ESG and sustainability. I, I'm not gonna assume everyone will call, but I'm gonna assume that a number of folks at least have heard of it and know what it is. I, I think it goes back to the basic questions. And, you know, if you go back to your website or you go back to your organization or the slides, the three slides that are about us, does it describe why you exist and what makes you distinct? And then how does that relate to the environment, to social or to what's happening in the world? That's at its most basic sort of terms. And then it's a matter of what are, what's the role that we play? given the size and capacity and geography we exist. It's gonna be different if it's in Europe or if it's in South America or if it's the United States based on the external factors and expectations of stakeholders, very different. Um, so I think you have to assume that. And then it's a matter of, of where do we start given the realities? What can we take on? What can we influence? Where do we wanna spend? And typically the hardest part is People are like, oh my God, we can do 18 things. It's really like, what are the one or two things we can have a true material difference on and how do we get started? So I think one piece of advice that I would have is like, don't be overwhelmed by the 7,000 metrics that you need to have in place or the fact that you don't have five-year goals yet. It's really probably starting with, come back to the brand. Who are you? Why do you exist? What's the role you play in an environment, society, mm -hmm. et cetera. And then sort of push on that. The more that you push on the brand, the more it'll answer some of the other questions. And the more relevant it's going to be to your senior executives because they're right. going to say, oh, this is who we are. Of course, of course, we're going to do this because this is the company we want to be. If right. you're in the health space or you're trying to deliver healthy or environment, they're going to be inter interrelated. Mm -hmm. There's, an, there's a, a direct connection between environment and health as an example. What we put in our bodies, what we put on our bodies, how it's grown, it's all connected. I mean, I've been in the food and wellness space for a long time. Yeah. I think there's some, some similarities here as well. Clearly differences, but similarities. I'm going to come back to what you just said also about, um, uh, about taking to the brand or coming to the brand and, and focusing on the brand. Um, I mean enterprise brand. I don't mean products. Sure. Absolutely. Um, which is a, a very, um, very apt point in the cannabis industry. Uh, Without federal legalization, it's it's either very difficult or illegal to advertise at a product level um, because, uh, well, just because of, of, of the lack of the legal framework. But of course, there's nothing stopping an organization uh, utilizing their marketing efforts and their communica communications efforts to focus on the brand. Can you tell us a little bit about, about that in relation to then sustainability and or ESG, no matter which channel you wish to go down. But, you know, from your experience, um, perhaps even from your time at Kind or Panera, uh, how, had, how have you, um, you, you put that into practice to focus on the brand? 
Well, I think, and not to get too technical on this, you want to look at what are the material issues to you? So what's most material to your business? What can you influence? And then also think about your priority stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Are the regulators, are they end consumers? Is it your team members or employees? Prioritize those issues, right? right. And then figure out, you don't say everything to every stakeholder at every time. You figure out what are we doing? Where do we mm -hmm. need to bolster? Where can we lead? Where do we need to get up to par? What are gaps we need to close? And it's a journey. It's one, three, five years. So you might say, hey, we're really good at this today. Maybe we can start talking about this to our, our employees and mm -hmm. team members. Right. We're not ready to shout on a billboard on, I live in Massachusetts, so I live on this, on a, you know, there's lots of attributes on billboards as I sort of <laughs> drive up from New York City to, to Massachusetts. So, but I think, I think that's kind of, that's kind of it. It's, it go back to the brand, mm -hmm. you know, where, where are the impacts? What are your geographies? What can you really make a difference on? What are you doing? If you're not doing anything, think about where can you start? What makes right. the most sense? Yeah. What's going to be most relevant to my stakeholders? Mm -hmm. And you can kind of work your way your way out. I mean, I'm trying to use terms that people can understand versus the technical reporting uh, mm -hmm. piece. Because I think if you end up with the tactic, you lose the first part, which is what's the brand? How is this relevant? How does this drive? They're not two separate things. There's a brand and then there's ESG, right? And there's a brand and sustainability. It's sort of what is, and that also helps you with the narrative. Mm -hmm because it's not a, this lives in our report and here's our brand and they're too distinct. That's back 1990 sustainability. We don't right. want to be there in this industry. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. driving to something that's really beautiful. You have a lot of opportunity to play in the world in a positive way. You also have some risks and some issues mm -hmm. and there's some culture wars around that too, that we have to be um, cognizant of. I don't know if that's the right term, but there's some, some challenges there, Right. Um, but it, it's not to avoid it. It's to acknowledge it, you know? And then the other piece, as you start to get into those issues, and this is, is to figure out who are like-minded organizations that can be advocates for what you're doing, the points of view that you have, and work with you on those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, I've got a, I'm watching the Q&A space, um, and, and I've, there's a couple of questions coming in. I'm going to... Give me uh, the easy ones, Jeff. Uh, yeah, well, there's no such thing as an easy one, although... Uh, um, well, I guess there's no such thing as an easy one. Uh, I just, before we dive to the Q and A, let me just ask um, about you know, two, two words that you also referenced just there, um, materiality and stakeholders. Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about materiality because increasingly folks are beginning to hear that term and they're beginning to understand what it is. Um, just sort of at a, at a tactical level, what are the, some of the things that communications experts need to do just so that they understand what is material to their business? Where, what should they be doing in that, in that domain? Yeah. I mean, in, in layman's terms, if you're not doing an assessment of, or if you haven't done it and a lot of organizations probably haven't done it, it's what are the issues that keep coming up in your industry? What are the expectations mm -hmm. of stakeholders in terms of how you operate based on your geography and the industry you play? Right. What are your yeah. impacts? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be different for, this industry than it will be for uh, apparel or other food products or other, right. or aviation. Like right. there, there are going to be different impacts on that or technology based mm -hmm. on from the beginning of where it's grown to where it's distributed. Right. That's sort of, you know, beginning to end of life of whatever the product or the industry is. So that's, that's the first thing. I mean, you can start with that with a Google search and even just understanding like, hey, what are some of the risks and some of, what are some of the challenges? Are we doing anything about that? Have we right. talked about that? Do we have a structure in place to deal with some of that? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, and then it's figuring out like, what are the most important things? Right. And I'll give you an example. You know, when I worked at, at Panera, I led um, sustainability and I led animal welfare issues. Mm -hmm. There's a bazillion things that you can tackle as a brand from beak trimming to gestation crates to, you know, the space for specific breeds. And I'm talking about from uh, laying hens to like to pigs to sort of in every issue, you, you, you need to know where to start. What are the mm -hmm. most important issues? How do you sort of, and where can you make the most impact based on your purchases? Panera right. bought a lot of chicken. They don't buy a lot of beef. So right. how do you, how do you sort of figure out where, where are you actually spending more of your money? Where do you have influence in the market? And also mm -hmm. what are the things that are most important? How you figure that out? I would have 
eight uh, NGOs from animal welfare organizations in one room. We had a, a meeting, open conversation, mm -hmm. and there were areas we could align on in terms of plant-based eating. There were things that they wanted us to work on, and we found common ground and got support. I think right. you're going to take those same kind of stakeholder skills and apply it in different ways once you figure out what your material issues are. Right. Yeah. But does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, well, to me, uh, I'm not the person to judge, and uh, we, we'll probably uh, get some um, <laughs> some folks uh, in the Q and A asking some questions uh, on that, just for if clarity is required. Um, let me. Um, then speak about stakeholders. Um, you know, increasingly, uh, brands and at, at the corporate level, so corporate um, folks need to be very aware of the different stakeholder groups. Obviously, you have internal stakeholders, your employees, and so on. Then, of course, you have your external stakeholders, which could be the regulators, it could be the folks that are creating the the laws, etc. Um, but it could also be, of course, media and, and so on. So generally speaking, um, how, how do you go about communicating to those different stakeholders, but ensuring that you're continually on message at that, that branded level? Is there anything that you could share with us there about how, how, how to sort of go about doing that? Yeah, the one thing that I'll, I'll say, so as you go back to purpose, who are you, why do you exist, what's that narrative? you identify the issues that are material or priority issues for you. You figure out what actually you're good at. Mm -hmm. Then you start thinking about how do we communicate? you always want to go inside out. So start internal. And then as you start to have more sensitive issues or areas where you're starting to work on, or you may mm -hmm. have weaknesses, the one biggest thing is to meet with external NGOs or others yeah. to be able to say, Hey, have we thought of everything? Is this yeah. the right language? And, right. and it also, whether you're working on diversity and inclusion issues, Mm -hmm. or you're working on environmental issues, or you're working on other issues, always getting that third party validation. It doesn't have to be a hundred organizations. It might be one or two to say, Hey, let me introduce yourself. This is what we're working on. You guys are an expert and meet right. with them and sort of say, even if it's, it's a small meeting before you really drive out your communications, you want to get that validation. Right. That's great. Um, Jonathan, this is super. I've got um, a couple of questions um, that have come in. Uh, they're both ESG related. Um, and uh, before we get to the questions, I'm just going to do a shameless plug for uh, future Regenibus Member Network webinars that we'll have uh, in uh, October, November, December. We will get into some deeper detail around ESG and we'll start looking at materiality and things like double materiality. We've got some great uh, future guests lined up as we have today to really get into some of the some of the discussions, deep discussion about ESG. But um, a question, first question from Chris Day. Um, there seems to be an ongoing assumption that companies care about ESG when the main goal is just to stay in business. How do we sell the idea that this is actually a must have, not just a nice to have when fighting tooth and nail just to stay compliant and not get taxed into oblivion? Oh. So what's the audience that we're talking about? Who are we fighting with? Let's go with uh, any stakeholder internal. you wish. Uh, let's just assume it's internal. I think that's what, that's why I really, I mean, on the agency side, I learned meant for, you know, I was on the agency side for 15 years and a lot of times we developed these great strategies and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden it would be like, well, why didn't this sell in? I think mm -hmm. that's why this goes back to brand and who, who and why we exist. If that's the first part, the compliance is going to be secondary. Mm -hmm. You have to do compliance, but then it's like, why does this make sense for who we want to be and where we want to be in the next one, two, three, four, five years? That's the biggest advice. If you sell on brand and you sell on this is who we are, um, it's a much easier sell than, hey, by the way, there's seven companies that are doing that. Did you know that? We're behind. That never works. There's 12 companies that have done it. Look at these guys. Look how much money they've given. We give yeah. less. That never works. Mm -hmm. It's really yeah. about who do we want to be? Where do we want to go? Right. How is this related? You still have to do the compliance. You might be you know, in an organization where it's like, I'm not even ready to have that conversation. That's okay. I'm happy to talk with anyone about that separately, but right. that's typically what I've seen in my career. Great. Okay. Uh, Chris uh, had just put a notice in there and I'm sure that you guys should connect actually. Um, uh, Chris and Jonathan, uh, subsequent to this webinar, Chris just added compliance in cannabis isn't ever secondary with a smiley. And he's yeah. absolutely right, of course. No, it's true. Um, and then, um, sorry, you go ahead. No, I, I, 
I don't, I mean, you're in a, it's a tough industry. Mm. It's evolving. It's I'm not, I'm not going to yeah. suggest it isn't, but I think the brand has got to be a bigger part of that conversation. Right. Okay. Uh, and then a, a second question then from Andrew D'Angelo. I don't see the will to invest in ESG right now. How do we activate the will of the cannabis industry to invest in ESG? So it's a slightly similar question, a little nuanced. Um, how do we activate the will of the cannabis industry to invest in ESG? I mean, I think there's two ways to go about it. You wait for externalities to hit you harder, right? Or you sort of look at what's coming around the corner. And part of that, this is why this is part art and science. There's no playbook, but you have to look at the geography you're in, some of the challenges we're going to be facing socially and say, hey, where do we think our risks are? What do we need to get ahead of? Mm -hmm. Who can we partner with to help close some of these gaps? And I think there's two conversations you can have with leadership. One is, uh, hey, this is licensed to operate risk and we need to get ahead of this before there's compliance. If you're regulated into it, you're always going to be behind. So how do you get ahead of some of this? And then how do you tie it closer to Brandon who you are? Those are the two areas. Right. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'll add to this too, uh, that um, I think one of the challenges we have generally, so even outside of the cannabis industry, is, is the ongoing nonsense, my term, uh, around ESG in terms of, you know, the, the sort of the, sort of blackballing of ESG. I just find odd. That's another issue for us to discuss another time. Um, from, I, I think that there's still a, a misunderstanding or a lack of communication for one of the term in terms of what ESG is. But for sure, if we only look at it from the aspect, from an organizational perspective of it being an indicator of performance, uh, then a measurement of performance, then we can see that ESG will become increasingly important because regulators and the market are demanding answers from corporations in terms of what are they doing around such environmental issues, social issues and governance issues. It's ultimately a question of managing risk, but if you manage those risks very successfully and you're on the front foot, to use the term, you're, you're more assertive, then that can deliver an, uh, an uplift in brand value and business value. And that's something that we'll be spending a little bit more time in subsequent webinars to, to speak to. Um, Jonathan, I'm mindful that we got to bounce because we've got, yeah. uh, we, have, uh, we have some of the guests who are gonna be joining us. Uh, listen, thanks ever so much uh, for bringing those you know, words of wisdom, those, those a couple of decades of experience there. Um, and uh, we'll put uh, Jonathan's uh, details, uh, his email address, et cetera, into the uh, chat the Q and A a little, a little later. Uh, but meanwhile, Jonathan, thanks ever so much for being a superstar and joining us. We really appreciate you being here. Thanks. Uh, thank you for having me. I hope to meet some of you um, another time as well. We'll be doing that for sure. Um, uh, next, uh, thanks ever so much. Again, thanks everybody for, for tuning in. Next up, we have Rebecca conti Core, and we have Danielle Drummond. Um, uh, you are both muted as it stands right now. And Danielle, if you could... Good to see you again, Danielle. Uh, first and foremost, of course, we met in May at the Regenerative Cannabis Live event, uh, which seems like decades ago, but it wasn't that long ago. And if I recall, you were very new at Ascend at that time, correct? I was. I had uh, just been a couple of months in at that time, um, about four months in at that time, and now I'm about 10 months in. So really happy uh, to be here with you again. Thank you so much for inviting me into that space, being so new into the cannabis space at that time. Um, and thank you for inviting me back here to continue our conversation. Uh, pleasure. Well, nothing like being thrown at the deep end, of course. Uh, but you handled yourself very, very well. We had a lot of really good comments from, uh, from the panel that you were on as well, which was all around social equity. A little bit more uh, about that in a moment. But first, we're going to turn our attention to your colleague and Rebecca Conticor, who is going to uh, give us a, a little bit of, uh, of an insight into the flavor of what's been happening at Ascend Wellness around ESG, sustainability, SDGs, SASB, SASB, uh, a whole sort of alphabet soup. Um, but uh, one of the forward thinking organizations when it comes to this, and we're thrilled, frankly, to have Ascent Foundation joined the Regenerous Member Network uh, just recently, so we really appreciate you, you leaning in and, 
and trusting us uh, uh, at Regenibus as part of that, the community that you wish to be part of. So Rebecca, I'm gonna hand over to you. Um, tough ask, you've got about five or six minutes and I, I'll come in every now and again, maybe and ask a question or just prompt you along. I know that you're not gonna uh, speak to all of the eight slides, but certainly um, they're there for reference. So over to you. Um, and uh, as we say in English, break a leg. Amazing. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thank you to the rest of the Regenibus team for welcoming, welcoming us today. We're excited to be here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rebecca Kaur, Head of Investor Relations for Ascend. Um, Ascend is a United States multi-state operator. Uh, we've got 22 dispensaries and 217,000 square feet of canopy across five different states, and we've got 1,800 employees. So um, we are in the, in the cannabis space and, and we're excited to be here today. Um, what we'll do a little bit of is uh, we'll get more tactical into what is ESG and reporting on ESG. And then I'm going to hand it over to Danielle, who is deep on the ground, actually actioning change and driving change uh, within the communities that we're in. And, and she'll talk about some of the social impact uh, items that we're working on. I'm glad with the sequence of this event, because I think uh, it was really helpful to have Jonathan up first talking speaking more strategically and about purpose-driven ESG. And then now I'll just dive in real briefly on um, what is ESG and our journey to date. Wonderful, thank so, you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so starting with what is ESG, obviously it's environmental, social, and governance, but there's a lot that falls under those acronyms and a lot that falls under those umbrellas. And it depends on what industry you're in and, and, and your purpose and things um, to determine what's important within each of those buckets. So for instance, um, in from an e-component, if you're a consumer packaged goods, your waste output might be very relevant and very important to you. But if you're an IT services business, your waste output's not so important, but um, from a governance perspective, how you manage privacy and, and security issues is really important. So I think um, evaluating the E, S, and the G and the different components under it is really specific to your industry and to Jonathan's point earlier, your purpose. Um, the next thing that I think is really important to touch on is just who are your stakeholders and, and what angle are they coming at this from? So you can have a whole host of, in, uh, of stakeholders that are interested in ESG, but they all want different information and they want to understand things from a different angle. Um, so you could have your customers, your existing customers, your potential customers, you can have your existing employees, your potential employees, you can have your investors, which is the lens that I often come from things uh, from because I'm investor relations. Um, you can have your partners, clients if you're B2B and everyone wants to look at things from a different angle and from a different perspective. Uh, and then I think the next important topic to cover when just describing what is ESG is um, two other pieces of the ESG landscape, one of which is the ratings agencies and the other is the reporting frameworks. So the ratings agencies basically are different firms out there that give you different scores for um, your ESG performance based on, on the information that you disclose. And again, they all have come at things from a different angle based on who their audience is. So you might have Institutional Shareholder Services, ISS, and this industry is full of acronyms, so we'll try to break them down. Um, ISS, which really comes at things from a shareholder perspective, they might look be more focus, focused on governance and things of that nature. Um, you've got MSCI, you've got Sustainalytics, which comes at things a little bit more from, from an eco-friendly perspective. Um, so you've got all these different ratings agencies that basically provide an assessment and a grade on your company so that they can provide that information to um, the, the purchasers of their data that are interested in evaluating you. And then the last piece um, that I'll just touch on from this ESG landscape is uh, the, the reporting framework. So similarly to financial data, how you have GAAP, globally accepted accounting principles, you've got IFRS, you also have these standards and reporting standards uh, for, uh, for ESG. So, uh, and there's a bunch of them. And again, they come at things from a different angle. And this is part of the challenge and part of the reason that this can seem so daunting and overwhelming, but I encourage everyone to just kind of focus on one or, or what, what's most relevant to them at the time. So uh, these are, uh, some of these examples include SASB, Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. That's one of the frameworks that a lot of institutional investors use to evaluate um, and, and use to make sure you're defining things the same. So similar to GAAP, how they make sure everyone defines revenue the same or net income the same. SASB, they have very clear definitions and they're making sure you define 
energy consumption the same. So you've got these different reporting frameworks. Um, so that's just to give you a little bit of a lay of the land of what is ESG, what's the ESG landscape from a really tactical level. And then I'll just touch on briefly um, Ascend's ESG journey. So, and, and, and actually ESG within the cannabis space. So I think it's very fair to say that the cannabis space is very behind uh, a lot of traditional industries and, and other industries such as consumer packaged goods, et cetera, when it comes to ESG disclosure and transparency and what they're actually doing at the ground level. And I think a lot of this is uh, driven by, at, at least from my perspective, uh, the investor community. So. Uh, cannabis companies, at least plant touching companies, have 95% of their investors are generally retail investors. These retail investors don't have ESG mandates. They're not necessarily putting their money where their mouth is and saying, you've got to comply. You've got to report alongside the SASB framework. You've got to report alongside TS, uh, TCFD, Task Force for Climate Related Disclosure. Um, similar to large institutions, uh, what they're doing, such as um, um, BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard, they're demanding change for the, their portfolio companies in the rest of the world. The cannabis industry doesn't have those institutions investing in us today, and that's because of the federal illegality and the custody issues. So until there's some sort of federal catalyst that allows those types of investors to, to enter the space, the, the, the investors we have today aren't mandating this. We could have customers mandating this and putting this where money where their mouth is, which is a really real uh, area to focus on and one of the reasons why we want to be so ahead of this and make sure you know we're actually because of the industry we're in and Danielle will get to this um, and the, the disproportionate effect that it has had on so many communities um, we could have customers that are driving this but right now we don't have investors driving this and I think that's one of the reasons why the cannabis industry is so behind other industries so what Ascend decided to do is, um, I think there was one other US MSO that put out an ESG report before us, and we wanted to at least put our flag in the ground and get started. It's, we're by no means finished, and I, I kind of call this the ESG light approach. Um, but what we tried to do last year was an integrated report with our annual report. So we IPO'd, we went public May 4th, we put out a, our annual report for 2021 um, in Q1 of this year, and we did an integrated report um, as, as part of that. And so one of the things that I'll do over the next minute is just walk you through a few slides from that report. We didn't do a 60 page ESG report that went into a bunch of uh, stories and the narrative focus of it. Um, we didn't necessarily set goals. That's gonna be for next year. We're gonna set goals for each of these areas and then we're gonna try to stick to those goals. What we wanted to just do for our first year was just tell people where we are and, and start from there. Um, so I'll dive into to what we did, and then I'm going to hand it over to Danielle, and she's got some really exciting things to talk about. So, uh, so this was the cover page. I'll just briefly skim through this. Uh, so we did talk about our commitment to ESG. We provided um, diversity metrics in accordance with the equal employment opportunity definitions. We've got a lot of work to do, but at least we, we've got it out there. And we said we're working towards more parity, we're working towards more equality, but this is where we are today. Um, from an environmental standpoint, we had some information, um, but not too much. We said usage metrics. This is something we're committing to providing by next year. We don't have it today, and but we're committed to providing the information by next year. We'll get you our energy emissions. We'll get you our water consumption, things of that nature. Um, and we touched on a few other initiatives. We pledged to eight of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And these are ones that were really aligned with our business and a lot of the work that Danielle is doing. So I'm not gonna um, go into this too much, but I'll just highlight a few um, gender equality. So we pledged to supporting gender equality and we actually started three employee resource groups um, as part of this pledge. And we've been working on those a lot. We provided some data that, that helped support this and, and, and next year we'll be able to provide goals on where we want to get to it. Um, sustainable packaging and recycling program, we talked about that. Um, another thing that we're doing this year, which wasn't in the report, is by the end of the year, we are pledging to have all of our exit bags when you leave the store be paper as opposed to plastic. So it's just another initiative we're working on. Um, one of the UN goals, peace, justice, and strong institutions. This is one that's very uh, overlapped with the work Danielle's doing, so, so I'll let her touch on that, but just wanted to go through some of the 17 goals of, of which we pledged to eight. Uh, on the next page, so we disclosed information in accordance with the SASB framework. 
there are a lot of frameworks out there. There's GRI, there's SASB. Um, we didn't want to overwhelm ourselves with so much data and tasking the internal team with so much data before we really were able to get them on board with the purpose and the value of this. So we decided to stick to one. SASB is really interesting because they're industry specific. So we kind of talked about this earlier, but um, if you're in the CPG business, maybe you're not so focused on, uh, on privacy, uh, privacy issues as you would be in the IT services. So it's very industry specific. Unfortunately, there's not yet a cannabis industry uh, framework for SASB. There's agriculture, which kind of fits. There's CPG, which kind of fits. There's pharmaceuticals, which kind of fits. There's uh, alcohol and beverage. We picked one. We picked alcohol and beverage and just decided to go with that from there. And then eventually, maybe if more cannabis companies start doing this, we'll be able to develop a cannabis relevant framework. Um, so so uh, I won't touch on what, what, okay. what the actual data is, but just so you, I know we've got uh, only a little bit of time left. We've got a page dedicated to governments, board independence, code of conduct, whistleblower hotline, things like that. And then the most exciting part, which is the part that aligns most closely with um, our, our business narrative and the work that Danielle is doing is the social impact initiative. So I'll hand it over to Danielle and, and she can dive into all the work she's doing there. Thanks guys. It's wonderful. Um, I, I have some questions, Rebecca, but we'll come back. Uh, there's also a couple of questions that have dropped into the Q and A. Um, so we'll come back and not to spoil the flow. So Danielle, over to you, um, but this is super exciting, super interesting. Absolutely. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Jeff. Um, so really, I just wanted to touch back really quickly on something that Jonathan had said earlier, which is bringing it back to the brand, right? And really, when we think about the social justice work that Ascend is taking part in, it's thinking about that wellness piece of our name. So how is Ascend really tapping in and supporting organizations as well as creating programming that keeps our communities happy, health, and safe? Happy, healthy, and safe. Um, and how are we working in partnerships with communities to bring healing and restoration where we know that systemic oppression and specifically an arm of that, the war on drugs, has brought devastation. Um, and so it's really being intentional about the partnerships that we're creating and understanding that, you know, as we look for organizations that the Ascend Foundation is going to support, we really want those organizations to be local to the community. We want those organizations to be run by members of the community. Um, one of the things that we understand is that people who have lived through the consequences of these systems understand best the solutions um, you know, to get around it. So as we are supporting organizations, we wanna support those, but then also as we build out our programming, we rely on conversations with these organizations, right? Jonathan talked about our stakeholders. How are we in conversations with our communities to understand what are the needs? What kind of programs are they looking for and how can we best support? Um, so that's really the framework that we enter into our social justice work through. Um, and so prior to the creation of my role, one of the things that Ascend had done and continues to do is to support the Last Prisoner Project. Um, so the Last Prisoner Project, of course, is a national organization. It's a nonprofit that's committed to working to, uh, you know, do advocacy as well as to support the families of those who have been incarcerated due to marijuana convictions. Uh, in 2021, we were Last Prisoner Project's top contributor. That allowed them to give over a million dollars worth of grants that paid for childcare, college tuition, and a variety of other needs, both for the incarcerated individual as well as for their family members here at the outside. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things since the creation of this role that I've tried to do is also to take a more localized and community-based um, approach to this as well. So finding those grassroots organizations in our communities that we're serving that are also working at the forefront of, of keeping our communities healthy. So organizations like the Michigan Cannabis Freedom Coalition, Clean Smoke, Westside Justice Center, uh, Voices of Liberation, mass cultivated. These are all organizations that are run by community members throughout our different states um, and are really working at the forefront of making sure that those communities are well. Um, and so we support them, of course, through our donations, but we also deepen that partnership through programming as well. And so one of the things that the Ascend Foundation has taken on is restorative justice as one of our pillars. We want to be able to host continuous expungement events across all of our states on a consistent basis, helping folks who have those records to get those records sealed. Um, in New Jersey is our full out pilot 
program where we're going to be doing them on a monthly basis for a year. That's really the frequency. That's really the urgency with which we should be meeting this need. Um, and so New Jersey allows us to kind of do that full out in a pilot. And then across our different states, we'll be making sure to do them on a consistent quarterly basis and then upping them, you know, year by year as we go along. Um, also, during those expungement clinics, we want it to be a resource fair. This is one of the things that feedback allows you to understand how to make these events actually more um, impactful for people. So we're going to be inviting in different resources, housing resources, mental health resources, um, education, et cetera, to those expungement clinics so that when folks are coming to get their record sealed, they can also access other resources as well. We're also using this as an opportunity to do some employment opportunities for folks. So people who are coming out who want to get into the industry, who want to get connected, are able to then connect with us there as well to hand us their resumes, to talk about, you know, what skills they need in order to get into the industry. So it's really, you know, expungement clinics, yes, but really an all-around resource here to make sure that folks are getting soup to nuts, all of their needs met. The other piece of that is that we partnered with organizations to take on interns who are returning citizens. So to date, we've had four interns, three in Chicago and one in Boston who had spent time for marijuana convictions who are helping us to build out our social equity work, right? We're able to give them a, a bird's eye view into the industry, but then they're also helping us to be able to create and vision what it really looks like to be doing social equity work in each one of our states. And, and that's been amazing for us as well as them. Um, when we then think about, so that's our first pillar with restorative justice. We think about our second pillar, it's really around economic empowerment. Um, that's one of the fallouts we know of the war on drugs of systemic oppression is that communities then are, you know, robbed of an opportunity to really thrive economically. So one of the things that we're doing is we are building out full incubation services for social equity applicants across each one of our states. Before that actually launches, we are in the meantime meantime, giving technical assistance, so helping people review some of their documents, um, giving mentorship when people have questions around the industry or things that they should be thinking about, like where should they locate their space or, you know, what are some of the ins and outs of operations? We're able to give folks that advice, um, you know, free of charge and to build those relationships. We often know that sometimes just getting into this industry, folks don't know who to ask or what to ask or where to go to. So we want to be able to fulfill that role and to, to fill in that gap as we know that a lot of this advice is often costly, right? It either comes at a consultant cost or at being in partnership or relationship that, you know, isn't always beneficial for the social equity applicant. So providing that technical assistance and mentorship is key until we have our incubation up and running. We are also providing um, free legal services and other incubation services to non-cannabis businesses. So in Michigan, we are supporting a Black woman-owned business. Um, we are giving her free legal services. We are also providing the down payment for her rental location. We are also providing mentorship in her thinking about how to build out um, her business and create something that thrives. Um, we also have some new and exciting things coming up that I'll, uh, I'll just touch on, but they're also called entrepreneurship zones. It is really the brainchild of Dr. Dale Caldwell, um, and we're partnering with him to think about how do we support small businesses in each one of the communities that we serve. And then lastly, it's around community engagement, right? So how are we sponsoring or giving money to organizations who are trying to educate the community about cannabis? Um, so we've sponsored events from Roll Up Life, from Let's Talk Weed, from 420NJ events that are gathering community members or specifically social equity applicants to help to teach them about the industry, um, help them get connected to the services that they need in order to learn um, and, and really to be able to thrive in this industry. Industry. So those are really the three uh, pillars that we're that we've been working in. Um, and I'll just before we get into the questions, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Carla Rodriguez of Wana Brands, who is uh, also in my role, and we found great alignment together and have been able to double down in our donations to certain organizations. So um, it's great to have an ally in that work. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I. I. I wow. I wish we had more time. Um, it's just fascinating. Um, uh, for those, uh, I'm sure that Rebecca, you, you're not going to have any problem me sharing these eight slides with folks who've read. I mean, it's all pretty much in the public domain, so that's fine. Yeah, not at so all. just so um, just to let folks know, then that you will see this, and I'll send a, a link when we send a, a, 
a recording or an email with a recording of this, um, there will be links in there for Rebecca, Danielle's email addresses, along with Jonathan's, et cetera, and this slide or oh, slides, these slides, thank you. But there's so much uh, detail in there and I, I, I love the, the approach. It's very both strategic and tactical and it, it really, I'm sure there's another conversation there around the communications aspect of how you kept on top of all of that within your organization, because neither of you are in the communication space. I mean, you're communicators, but you're not in the communication department. So you're, I guess you're working with the communications team at all times, correct? Yeah, we, we don't have an internal communications team per se. It's, it's, it's a definitely a little bit of a shared function. Mm -hmm. I handle external communications along with investor relations. So we, we've got that kind of going with us, but it's completely cross-functional. Right. And we're still in the process to what Jonathan mentioned before of really getting that internal uh, mm -hmm. support. We definitely got a lot of support from the social impact side. Even the mere right. fact that we've got a dedicated position for Danielle right. is huge. Yeah. Um, but we've got a lot of work to do in terms of the cross-functional support and, and just getting alignment internally. And I think that's the challenge that every company faces. Yeah. And uh, just uh, in, in the Q&A and chat, there's a note there from Andrew D'Angelo, of course, from uh, LPP, just thanking you for your support there and the work that you've done. And I, I see it and I feel it. I met Mary Bailey recently uh, at an event in Europe, and she was also just ecstatic uh, with some of the work that, that you guys have been doing with them. So huge kudos to you. Um, um, I'm going to come back to another question that was posted here, uh, Rebecca, for you, um, which was a question from Alex Jacobs. Have you noticed any investors asking for specific ESG frameworks to align report in accordance with? You mentioned there are many. You've chosen SASB. Was that your decision or, or as Alex is asking, have any investors suggested or, or, or given an indication as to which particular frameworks they would like to see you follow? Sure. So in my past life um, from the IR position, I was in IT services and I had daily requests, multiple daily requests for different frameworks um, and, and our reports and, and different data, um, et cetera. I don't have any, any requests in the cannabis space at all. I think yeah. I've had one and it, it, it was Kelly um, on the line from, from the Regenerative <laughs> team with their fund. So I don't have any. And I think that's part of the reason the cannabis industry is so behind because the investors that put their money where their mouth is, uh, are really in the, the large institutions and they can't enter our space yet because of the federal illegality. So I think it'll be a while until investors are driving that change, but all the work Danielle does is really going to impact our customers and the communities that we're operating. And I think that's what will drive the change today. And right. we're just trying to get ahead of the game for the, from the investor perspective. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, it's just fascinating. And I think that, um, Remind me when when are you due to be publishing your next report? Where where are you in the? In so we did an integrated report last year. So we integrated it with our annual report. I think that's nice because to Jonathan's point earlier, it weaves the whole story together. Totally. Um, and then you just have one reporting cadence to, to kind mm -hmm. of be aligned with, and all your numbers are as of year end. Um, yeah. So the next one would be uh, in March. In March. Okay, that's good to know. I, I think there's a. A couple of conversations I know that we could be having uh, with you uh, around, um, and again, another shameless plug, I suppose, at, at Regenibus, you know, we're in the process of building out a SaaS platform for ESG reporting. And we have firmly landed on SASB as the reporting framework because we can see, so the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, there. Uh, as they are becoming part of then the Value Reporting Foundation, now part of the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, which is also part of the IFRS, the International Financial Reporting Standards. So this is a uh, sort of stacking up um, of, uh, of all the frameworks. The SASB framework uh, seems to be the one that's gaining momentum as the one that's likely to emerge as one of the principal frameworks. I think if you go from seven to two or three, that, that's what we're seeing. What we're doing is to speak a little bit more to the materiality aspect is we are going to create the sustainability uh, and the, the ESG framework standards for the cannabis industry because we've looked at the 79 sectors and identified what of the 26 reporting topics 
which are the ones are most relevant for the five verticals of cannabis, the, the license types, whether it's from cultivation across to dispensaries. And we are now in the process of baking those standards into the, uh, into the uh, ESG um, uh, SARS platform, including then a reporting template. So what we ideally would like to see then is a, a standardization of the report that comes out uh, from cannabis companies. So more on that in future uh, iterations of these webinars. Um, and we'd love to have you back, Rebecca, to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, go a little deeper into some of the aspects of materiality and double materiality. Sure. Um, but we're, um, we're very close to the end of this webinar. Um, it's fascinating. Again, it's, it's incredible how fast time goes uh, when you're in, you know, thick into this, these, these webinars. I really want to just say thanks ever so much to both uh, Rebecca and to Danielle for, for joining us and sharing with us and our audience these uh, critical you know, work programs that, that you're undertaking at Ascend. There's some really cool stuff here and very much ahead of the curve when it comes to cannabis companies. So huge kudos to you both for the work that you're doing. And also to Jonathan, I think he's still on the line, uh, for bringing some of those you know, smarts after 20 plus years of working in, uh, in, in other industries. And I could foresee a great opportunity or opportunities for you to bring some of those smarts into the cannabis space. And no doubt from an advisory board perspective, we'll have you on future, future meetings and perhaps um, meet some of, of our audiences at Regenerative Cannabis Live when we convene in May uh, in New York. Um, I think we're out of time, Patrick, am I, am I right? We are out of time. Yeah, we're just a minute over. And I know everybody, well, most have to jump for another, other meetings at, what, 10 a.m. Pacific. So, yeah. um, well, uh, just to echo Jeff's uh, points to Danielle, Rebecca, Jonathan, thanks ever so much for, for joining us. Very critical in conversations for this, for the cannabis industry, of course, uh, as we, again, we're at the very, very start of this journey on, on ESG, which is a great thing. And it's going to be challenges, of course, but um, this is great to show to showcase the leadership that Ascend Wellness is showing uh, and that other companies can can uh, look at as a leading light. So uh, thanks very much for joining us. And we'll, we'll definitely have you back because there's lots to lots to dive into uh, with so little time. Um, but just to, just before we go, uh, I want to thank everybody again uh, for joining us. We will be putting this up on the Regenibus YouTube page. So uh, we'll also be sharing the links and all of the uh, the links associated with Ascend's work. Uh, if you do want to get in contact with us, feel free to reach out to info at regenibus.com. There was a lot of questions that came through. We didn't get to answer all of them. Um, and if you have any questions about the, the Regenibus, any questions about what we're doing at Regenibus, feel free to reach out to us. Our team are ready. Uh, and we look forward to our next meeting on the third Tuesday of uh, October. Uh, and it's the third Tuesday of every month, by the way, is when we have our, our Regenibus member meeting. So um, yeah. thanks everyone again. And yeah, we'll I just put another time. answer in there uh, from Amanda Friedman asking, when are we, what's the target release time for the cannabis standards and reporting template? And I said quarter four, but please reach out to me at jeff at regenibus.com to learn more about ESGXL and the, and the fascinating work that I think we are undertaking in, in the space to standardize this aspect of ESG uh, reporting in the cannabis space using some already well-known standards, but we've basically uh, uh, adopted and adapted. And we have full blessing of SASB to do this. They're actually quite excited about the fact that we're taking and tackling the cannabis industry head on. Um, so they've, um, they've reached back out to us uh, to learn more. So we're developing a great relationship with SASB as well. So looking forward to that. Um, on that, once again, thanks ever so much. And thanks to all of our attendees for tuning in. Um, and as I said, there will be a, an email follow-up with a, uh, a live recording link, as well as um, email addresses for Rebecca, for Danielle, and for Jonathan. I encourage you to reach out to them directly. Um, please do so. That's part of what we're doing in our community. And reach out to myself, Patrick, or Kelly, should you have any questions about the work we're undertaking at Regenibus. We'll see you again soon. Happy Tuesday. And thanks again, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.